half an hour. But first, have you done your shopping yet? What have you been buying? Tonight's been heading down the supermarket aisles to find out here on ITV1. Tonight, the psychology of shopping. The shopping baskets are being studied more intensively now than probably at any time in, in, in consumer history. You've got to realise a supermarket is not really a shop at all. It's kind of a, a super clean, super selling machine which uses all your sensory awareness to try and sell to you. The tricks that part customers from their cash. When you play quiet and gentle and slow paced music in supermarkets, people walked 12% more slowly. As a result of doing that, they spent 38% more money. And what your trolley reveals about you. Well, it's, it's a woman, possibly a, a single mother. I would say certainly has at least one kid, school age, primary school, something like that. Are you Hiya. a single mother with kid or kids? Yes, it was spot on there. Good evening. With annual sales of around £88 billion, you may think that supermarkets already take enough of our money. But as was revealed last month, some of the biggest retailers are planning to use psychologists in an attempt to understand their customers better and to sell them more. Sophisticated marketing tricks may be nothing new, but what will surprise you is the way supermarkets use sights, sounds, even smells to encourage us to buy and how they set out to find personal information about us to help them sell. Here's Jonathan Maitland. OK, I admit it. I'm obsessed with supermarkets. I read books on them, I make programmes about them, and they're currently my main topic of conversation at parties. What fascinates me is how the retail giants have millions of us exactly where they want us, and the fact that they know more about us than I could ever have imagined. That's because they study our shopping habits with a fervour that borders on the religious. It's very simple. The more they know about what goes into our trolleys, the more money they can make from us. The key to it is that as far as their marketing departments are concerned, we really are what we buy. Hello, I'm in the club already and she wants to join. It's loyalty cards that provide the key to their studies. Using one at the checkout may earn you just a few pence discount, but for the supermarkets, the information it provides is a gold mine. Expect details of your weekly shop to be analysed and scrutinised by an army of experts. They even have a name, trolleyologists. The shopping baskets are being studied more intensively now than probably at any time in, in, in consumer history. Dr David Lewis knows a bit about trolleyology himself. He's a psychologist who advises the big retailers on how to attract customers and then encourage them to spend more. The job of a supermarket is to, is to give you what you want, when you want it. And somebody once said to me, you know, I'm in a profession where people don't tell me, they say, I don't, can't tell you what I want, I can't tell you when I want it, but when I want it, you better have it. And essentially that's the business of supermarkets, is giving people what they want, when they want it. And they try to satisfy your needs and they do that by data mining the information you provide them through your credit card, your loyalty card and, and uh, any other way you pay. And, and how much um, does this data mining, this um, kind of analysing purchases, mm. um, how much more does that make shoppers spend than they kind of need to really? <laughs> it's very hard to say, but I would say probably about 25% of things they persuade you to buy, which you perhaps hadn't had in your head when you went into that supermarket. But when you see it, wow, you've got to have it. But before they can persuade you, they need to know what sort of person you are. So, with the help of four typical shoppers, we're going to see how good they are at finding out. First up is Dean from Fife in Scotland. He's a second year student, so not surprisingly, he's watching the pennies. I buy as many two for ones as I can usually, just because um, you might as well. I mean, admittedly, sometimes I don't eat them, but they kind of catch my eye anyway, so I put them in there, and one of my flatmates will eat them if I don't, so it's always good. Our next shopper is Stacy, a single girl and cereal snacker from Surrey. I usually buy a lot of crisps because they're great for when you're watching television, just opening a bag of crisps. I'm just quite lazy at, you know, nine o'clock at night, getting in late, um, just having a snack, yeah. 
Alison is a busy single mum. She lives in South End with her two young kids and she's attending university as a mature student. I sort of have a mental shopping list, so, um, you know, sort of basics in my head, but I always tend to buy more than I planned, definitely. And finally, there's Emily, who, as far as I'm concerned, spends far too much down at the supermarket. But then I'm entitled to say that, because she's my wife. Well, I do try and buy organic wherever possible, if it's not too expensive, especially for things like bread, because I do pack lunches for my kids, so I just think it's better for having sandwiches every day if, you know, it's just a little bit healthier. We asked our four shoppers to take a typical trip to the supermarket, and we also asked Dr Lewis to analyse each of their trolleys, and without meeting them, to see if he could work out their age, sex and lifestyle. The first trolley belonged to Dean. All right, let's have a quick look. He's our impoverished student. I would say this is somebody who lives, um, maybe lives in, in lodgings uh, some, but with other people, but he's not particularly necessarily living in a relationship. It's uh, mm, yeah. savings, so they're looking for savings. This is almost certainly a, the kind of shopping you'd expect from a student. They're looking for cost consciousness, they're looking for things that are easy to uh, cook and they're not too concerned with their, uh, with their health. <laughs> okay. Bit harsh. <laughs> I would say it's almost certainly a student, yes, probably a male student. Okay, well, shopper A, come on down. Oh, well. Good nice to see you. Yeah. He got it right, didn't he? He did, he got it right in one, <laughs> yeah, pretty much. <laughs> How valuable would um, someone like Dean be to a supermarket? Because actually, Students don't spend very much, do they? No, but students grow up to be people perhaps with families and, you know, what do we want to get is lifetime loyalties. And what kind of um, techniques would they use to extract what little money Dean has? <laughs> <laughs> very clever ones. When, when they haven't spent on binge drinking. Well, yeah, I mean, they would, uh, they would do special offers. They would perhaps have special, some, some shops have special discounts for students on your student union yeah, cards yeah. and things like that. So anything really to, to lock you in. They're not so concerned about making money from you now, but they're certainly concerned with you spending a lot of money with them over the years to come. Right, we'll find out if the doctor can correctly identify our other three shoppers later on, but right now I'm going to show you some of the techniques that supermarkets use to make them, and us, part with more cash. It all starts with the way the stores are designed, and that's not surprising, because retailers' own studies have found that we make a staggering 80% of our shopping decisions subconsciously, and that that subconscious is influenced by things like layout. There's a huge amount of resource that goes in understanding how people shop um, and therefore what's the best way to lay out a store or to lay out a fixture or to promote products. So what, are there whole teams of people in, in all the big supermarkets in devoting both, all their time to this? In both the supermarkets and the manufacturers, so the big brands um, spend a lot of time studying what people do and then using that information to um, make better displays or better layouts. And what, what are their job titles like? Psy you know, aisle psychology manipulator officer or...? It tends to be shopper insight manager or something like that. <laughs> Simon heads a design consultancy that's worked for all the major supermarket chains. He took me on a tour of a typical one. OK, this is the entrance. Not much happening here. There's a reason for that. Um, when we come in from the outside, we've just been in the car park, it's perhaps raining, people rush into the store. Um, it takes some time to slow down, to actually be aware that the fact they're in the supermarket. So if I put stuff here, people are going to just walk straight past it. So it would just be wasted to have big displays here then? Yeah, so if I put a bulk stack of a huge deal, everybody walks straight past. Let's walk past then. Now, fruit and veg, is it significant that that's the first thing we see in this place? Just about every supermarket will put fresh produce first. Two reasons behind that. One, for the customer, actually what I'm doing here when I first come in is, is building a meal, so I need to have vegetables here. For the supermarket, what it says is fresh, colourful, invigorating, interesting. So whilst the shop itself is actually pretty dull, um, this, this stuff here makes it appear more exciting. So it's about putting the, the customer in a good mood? It's about putting the customer in a good mood. The presentation, that this is probably one of the most important areas for us to present products well. In fact, you'll notice that this is the only area of the store where there's much higher lighting to create some, some sparkle uh, to the product. In just a few minutes, I learned how the stores strategically place their best promotional offers near other products they want to sell. They also discovered why the floors are always plain. That's so they won't clash with all the colours of the different items on the shelves. 
And you know those shallow trolleys? Well, they were apparently brought out as an alternative to baskets, so shoppers could carry more stuff to the checkout. And the mind games don't end there. Where we're standing at the moment, it's quite dull. Um, so I'm going to be comfortable standing here and shopping. If you put me into a bright light, I'm going to be much less comf comfortable about being exposed, if you like, in a, in a bright light, and therefore I'll shop more quickly. Really? So the duller the light, the, um, the longer you stay? Yes. And the more you spend? The more time you spend, yeah. Well, if you think that's clever, let's see our trolleyologist in action again. It's time for Dr David Lewis to analyse Stacey's shopping. And Stacey, you'll remember, is a busy career girl. OK, Mr Store Detective. <laughs> um, who is, mm. what kind of a person is Shopper B? Well, let's have a quick dig in the basket. Here we have some uh, avocado. I would say this is the basket perhaps of a, of a single woman. Um, perhaps living on her own, again, cats, nice companionable animals, Could does a like, bit of cooking, probably does a bit of entertaining. Got a quite big uh, box of crackers there. So, what did he deduce? So you think Shopper B is, is basically a bit of a Bridget Jones? <laughs> probably a bit of a Bridget Jones, yes. Very interesting. Shopper B, come on down. Hello. Stacey, this is Dr Lewis. <laughs> Hi, Hello, Stacey. Stacey. Hi. How accurate was he? Pretty accurate. I do enjoy cooking and I've always got people coming around for dinner, so I do like to prepare um, very posh recipes. And I spend far too much money down there. <laughs> I'm sure they wouldn't think that. I'm sure they wouldn't think and that. And how would the supermarkets extract more money from Stacey than they already do? No. Looking, at this, <laughs> looking at this basket in particular. Oh, at this basket in particular, I think I would be offering her uh, new, mess new recipes and new menus for her uh, when she's entertaining, offering things which were unusual, different, so your guests would be talking about the things you serve. I think if I went down that road, I could probably sell you quite a lot of quite expensive foods, because I, I think you'd be very interested in, you know, I could sell you wines as well. You, you know, you're very keen on food and cooking and entertaining people. That's great. So, as Bridget Jones would say, memo to sell. <laughs> Um, be very canny when next in the supermarket yeah. and carry on being choosy. The next basket belongs to Alison. Who is Shopper C? Who is she that all her swains condemn her? Our mature student from Essex. And You're saying the person school. whose basket this is has a kid? I would say younger, certainly yeah. has at least one kid. Yeah. Um, yeah. Young, school, school age, probably young, youngish school age, perhaps primary school, something like that. Okay, go on then, stick your neck out. Uh, okay, then. well, it's, it's a woman now. The interesting thing is, I don't think it's possibly a, a single mother, simply because there's not enough here to indicate a family purchase. So, so oh, that's yeah. right. <laughs> It could be completely wrong. But I say health conscious, the detox cordial. I never actually heard of that, so there we are. So lots of, lots of healthy eating, kids stuff, fun things for kids, perhaps fun things for kids' lunchboxes. OK, Shopper C, let's be having you. Hello, Alison. Hiya. Right, Alison, are you Hiya. a single mother with kid or kids? Yes, it was spot on there. Yeah, I've got two children. Two children? So, yes. Quite young? Quite young. Um, three and five. Okay. So, so uh, well, one's going to school, is it a five-year-old? They're both at school. Oh, one's okay. at preschool, one's so you, at... you make stuff up for them, do you? Yes. Things? What product is there amongst these that, um, if you're a supermarket data reader, <laughs> exploiter, you would say, right, let's sell her stuff related to that? Well, we'd certainly look at anything which they would certainly look at anything which was related to organic food, homegrown food, authentic food, this kind of thing. People are getting more and more keen on that. Um, British product, buying British product. Things for kids, little nice little uh, new treats, nutritional treats to put in the lunch basket. That's, That's always it. a nightmare to know what to pack in the lunch That's basket it. and do it quickly. Um, and and things, things they eat as well. And, and things they like. So yeah. there's all, all three areas at least, health, children and, and good food. Well, so far so good. Spookily good, in fact. But it remains to be seen whether he can guess my wife's lifestyle purely on the strength of her shopping basket. As you may have gathered, a lot of what goes on in there is governed by what goes on up here. We've already shown how we make unconscious shopping decisions on the basis of what we see. But did you know that the amount we spend is also influenced by what we hear? This man makes his living advising retailers about the effects of noise and music on their customers. His first tip, minimise unpleasant sounds as they can actually stop us spending. But what exactly qualifies as an unpleasant sound? First of all, uh, and people won't be aware of this very much, is air conditioning. 
This is a horrible low frequency sound. It makes you feel uncomfortable. It makes you feel stressed. It's very metallic and cold, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it is. Yes. Then on top of that, and this is my personal favorite, chiller cabinets. When you say it's your personal favorite, you mean it's your most hated sound? Yeah, I'm afraid yeah. so. We it's a very kind of ugly factory sound, isn't it? Really. It's, it's, a, it's an industrial sound, yeah. and again, it creates stress. Your argument being that this is utterly unconducive to spending money. You don't want to stand next to these things for no. longer than you have to. No. Then we've got the sounds of people stacking the shelves and this is badly maintained equipment. Here's a lovely trolley. We've all had one of these coming right behind us. And finally, as you get to the checkout, <laughs> another one which everybody will recognize, which is those Beep, lovely beeps. beeps. Yeah. All the same frequency, up and down the row. Yeah. Julian's solution is to introduce relaxing music into the background to help drown out the sounds we don't like. And choosing the right piece can apparently dramatically increase the store's takings. The most famous study showed that when you play quiet and gentle and slow-paced music in supermarkets, people walk 12% more slowly. That's called entrainment. You, you slow down because the rhythm's outside, you are slow. Mm. As a result of doing that, instead of going in with a commando raid, doing the shopping list, getting out as fast as possible, they were noticing things on the shelves and they spent 38% more money. According to recent research, music doesn't just influence how much we spend, it can actually change what we choose to buy. In one shop, they did a study of French and German wine promotions, which were both running simultaneously. On day one, they played French music. On day two, they played German music. And naturally, on day one, the French wine sales shot up, and on day two, the German wine sales shot up, simply because, I suppose, people were feeling a bit French or feeling a bit German on those days. There's clearly a pattern here. Supermarkets are manipulating our senses, the way we look at things, the way we think about them, the way we hear them. But there's one faculty which, until now, they haven't taken as seriously as the rest, and that is our sense of smell. But that could all change because, according to experts, supermarkets are now preparing, quite literally, to lead us by the nose. Meet Simon Harrop. His company has put various smells in 600 stores oh, across the UK. <laughs> Is that chocolate? It is indeed. Yeah. Well done. <laughs> His job is to manufacture smells. Oh my god. That can be pumped into shops. Is that alcoholic? Mm, no, it would be. Oh, don't get that one. No, ginger cake. Simon's firm produces hundreds of fragrances. They include freshly cut grass for sport shops and leather for a car showroom. Now, though, the biggest retailers are getting in on the act. To what extent are our supermarkets playing with our sense of smells at the moment? There are a few examples. Um, we, uh, there is this idea that um, you know baby powder smells in a baby powder aisle will help uh, you know, uh, mothers and fathers, new, new fathers, to identify that category. But it's also sort of tweaking their senses again. You know, you're a, a new mother or a new father. You want the best for your child. That's being done as we speak. Somebody somewhere is being subconsciously manipulated into buying more baby goods because their nostrils are being assaulted by the smell of talcum powder and they don't know about it. Uh, well, they do know about it because you, if you, you can smell it. So, you know, this idea that it's subliminal is just not on because you, you can notice the smell. Um, manipulate it to the same extent that, you know, retailers do all the other things in terms of their retail design to try and encourage us to spend more. Oh, I, I know what it is. And it's there. really smart. G give me another one, give me another one. Another smell? Yeah. Okay. It's garlic. Exactly right. Well done. Simon argues that his fragrances make shopping a more pleasant experience. And more importantly for the stores, those smells make us more susceptible to their marketing. There was research that we did a few years ago where we had two identical pairs of night trainers, one in an unscented room and the other in a scented room. And in the scented room, we asked consumers which, which pair of trainers they preferred. And 84% of the respondents said that the, the trainers in the, the scented room were their preference, but also on average they were prepared to pay $10.33 more than the trainers in the unscented room. With results like those, it's no wonder business is brisk. This company plans to double its staff in the next six months, and it's about to sign a deal with a major UK supermarket. So how long do you think before we go all the way with smells and it's supermarket shopping becomes in effect, scratch and sniff shopping. I think in the next two years, 30% of the big retailers will be doing it, and by the end of the decade, they will all have to do it. Right, it's now time for the final part of our mystery shopper test. And the last person to have her shopping analysed, my wife, Emily. 
Um, shopper D. Shopper D, our mystery shopper. Well, our mystery shopper obviously likes a bit of a quite expensive beer. No, and I also don't. I spotted in here a rather a nice wine. Chilean wine, very yes, nice that's for me. On the other hand, quite interested in healthy living at the same time. So expensive tastes. Uh, yes, yeah, a good level of disposable income, certainly. Um, you know, they, they're not short of a bob or two, I would say. Um, they're <laughs> a little, yeah, again, a, a healthy, a healthy option. The, the yogurt and quite a lot of little yogurts. Now, this makes me think that these people have probably got kids, and this makes me think they've probably got kids even more so because these are the kind of things you buy for kids and finally chicken so um, you know lean meat very very nice very good lean meat as a vegetarian I wouldn't eat it but nonetheless I commend people who do eat it because it's very good for you good source of protein okay who is what is well this Chopper D, uh, Chopper D uh, is uh, is a family uh, <laughs> collectively go shopping but nonetheless for kids don't know how many kids perhaps a couple of kids um, probably slightly older than, uh, than than one might think. Probably perhaps in their in their late, late early before they'd come into their teens, pre-teens, something like that. Um, good living if they if they, if they are a family. If I'm right, then I would think both couples, both people in the relationship, work. Probably got quite a high disposable income. If they see it and they like it, they'll buy it. Shopper D, come on stage, please. Come on down, Generally, he, he was pretty good. My kids are 11 and 13, nearly 12 and 14. Um, I'd say he was a bit wrong about the you know, disposable income thing because I do, <laughs> I do try, look, buy one, get one free. Yeah, I yeah. fall for all those things. I really try and, and keep and, the and price and down, mm. but with the odd treat, like a bottle of wine. Okay. That was yeah, reduced yeah. wine. This, that this was a yeah, yeah. special mm. offer. So, overall, a pretty good assessment of Shopper D. One thing he didn't guess, though. It's my wife. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, okay. That, so, did you? so you, you, you're not in a job then? Are you? Well, no, I'm. Mean, you said that there's only one. You said two incomes. It's just one income. A slight issue in our house when she comes back having spent 150, 170 quid. No, I don't spend that much. You do sometimes. Once in a blue moon, I do, and then I. Yeah. Which is wild. Ah, uh, right. Yes. Uh, time to move on. I think. I feel an unwinnable argument coming on. Still, at least the experiment was a success, with the doctor correctly guessing the main characteristics of all four shoppers. It seems the supermarkets really do know all about us. And as we've seen, they have new ways of making a shop. Jonathan Maitland reporting. And that's nearly all we have time for this evening. On Monday, age rage. Why Britain's pensioners are in revolt over the council tax. And why many more would rather be jailed than pay. It is a way of making this government sit up and listen to what we have to say and anybody that is prepared to make this government sit up and listen, go for it. Why have council tax bills risen so much over the last five years? And is the money being spent wisely or is it being wasted? Unclean! And you can see that report on Monday night at 8 o'clock. Until then, from all of us here, goodbye and thank you for joining us.